A young father lost his wife, leaving him to raise their newborn son. The abrupt and sudden loss left the father exceedingly timid in life, causing him to see danger in everything. This led him to becoming overprotective, overbearing, overwhelming to his son as he grew older. He kept him under lock and key. Being on top of his son gave him a sense of comfort, a sense of control, a control that the father had lost when he lost his wife, but felt like he was able to regain through some of the decisions he was making. As luck would have it, the father's worst nightmare would come true. His son would go missing. Now this would be terrifying for any parent, but this father knew his son never had the proper training for surviving in this world. He never gave him a chance to develop those skills. He was barely allowed to play in the front yard. He doesn't even know how to find his way back home. He doesn't have those street smarts. The father had been so fearful of what could go wrong in life that he wasn't ready for when they actually did. That's a hell of a way to start the morning, right? I'm just warming up. So we're here to talk about stress this morning. Now, stress comes in an infinite number of forms and manifests itself in just as many ways in your life. The common thought is that stress is bad, right? And as a result, people try to avoid stressful situations. And when it comes to the stressful periods of their lives, the reaction, the desire, the focus is, how do I get out of this? This morning, I would like to suggest to you that you do not put your energy into resisting, fighting, or fleeing stressful situations and hard times, but instead, we lean into them. Back in, in June, I had the honor of being named one of Ottawa's top 40 under 40. I, I can hear you from here. Just hold your applause. This is no big deal. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. In celebration, I posted the announcement on my LinkedIn. And some guy took it upon himself to comment on my post that nobody respects people with the criminal record and that me and my bros need to learn to respect the law and society. It was fascinating to see how many people who were completely in shock and awe that one of their fellow white people would speak in a derogatory fashion to a black person. Well, I spent considerable amount of time trying to educate people that these were actually the types of comments that many of us have had to endure our whole lives, explicitly and implicitly through the media, the education system, teachers, co-workers, bosses, the police, and yes, just random, opinionated, outspoken people on the streets and online. But through it all, the dominant society has turned a blind eye to what has been happening before them all along. As a matter of fact, my whole life, white people have been telling me that Canada is not racist. Individuals who would say and do hurtful, offensive, and racist things would look me in the eye and tell me that they are not racist. I and many in racialized communities live in a world where our experiences are not in alignment with the dominant narrative that shapes our society. Canada's multicultural. Canada is inclusive. Canada doesn't have a history of racism and it doesn't play any part in the current society. This is what I have been told time and time again. So if racism doesn't live here, then where have I been living all this time? Denying us of our experience is a powerful form of oppression. Saying that racism doesn't exist 
over policing doesn't exist, discrepancies in healthcare don't exist, that being denied a job, a mortgage, or proper service in a store because of the color of your skin doesn't exist, then do I even exist? Many well-intentioned folks talk about being colorblind. But that, again, is a denial of my experience. When so much of my experience and my existence has been tied to the color of my skin, when every day you are reminded of your color, when it has shaped your every move and interaction within a society, it is impossible for you to be colorblind. Colorblindness is a denial of the inequities that persist throughout our culture. Color blindness is an excuse for inaction. Color blindness is a luxury for the dominant society. A month ago, I put out a survey to capture the experiences of racialized communities in the workplace in order to quantify and bring some awareness to what the colorblind have been ignoring. And here's some of the findings. 80% of us have the expectation of experiencing racism in the workplace. So when we walk into a building, we are already on edge waiting for somebody to say or do something ignorant. 84% of us said that we have experienced discomfort due to the actions or comments that people have made regarding race. And that 40% of those said it happens so often they can't even keep track of all the indiscretions. But most are not reporting these indecencies when they experience them because nothing ever happens. And they just get labeled as troublemakers, further isolating them and making life more difficult for them when trying to navigate through this society. Here's what you need to understand when it comes to many within racialized communities. There is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, mental and emotional tax that is being paid. Similar to the RAM on a computer, with every application that you run, it eats up some of the finite resources that a computer has, right? Some apps take up a lot of RAM like Chrome. And the more tabs and windows you have open, the more RAM it eats up but applications can be closed, thus freeing up some RAM and improving performance. However, a computer's operating system requires a base level amount of RAM just to be able to function. I don't know if you've ever used a computer that was maxing out its RAM, but it drastically affects performance. Racism is like OS level RAM usage. Before you even open any applications or try to perform any tasks, it's already draining a certain percentage of your faculties. You ever use someone else's computer and they've had to develop all of these workarounds and hacks just to make the thing work for them? Like they, they, they click to open an application and their computer's so slow they have time to go put on a pot of coffee, go to the bathroom, by the time they get back, the application's ready to use, or, or, or they create these shortcuts, or they have to jiggle the wire just so, just so it, it, it charges properly. They got 58,000 unread emails. As a primary user, you get used to navigating through your chaos. It's not until somebody else uses it and they start to really see how you're living that you start to remember it's not supposed to be this way. Strength, resilience, and creativity are core tenets for people of color to navigate through this society. Growing up, teachers, media, the world around me made me believe that I could not be whatever I wanted, that I was inferior, that I was less capable. 
So any thoughts I ever had around my career were always inhibited by the usual, you know, what am I passionate about? What do I have skills for? What can I get paid for? But then there was this underlying stress of was that thing even in the realm of possible for someone like me? Feeling like there was no place for me taught me to see things and approach things differently. I had no other choice. I was always different. In a lot of the spaces that I would find myself in, I would look different. People always said that I talked different. My cultural context was different. How teachers treated me was different. How I was punished in school was different. So I became very comfortable as different comfortable in being places where no one thought like me. No one shares my opinions. No one quite sees the world how I see it. In hindsight, I can speak about it with a positive twist. But growing up, there was nothing I wanted more than to just be like everybody else. It's funny though, because despite that desire, I was never really one to, to acquiesce to the crowd. I just wanted more people in the crowd to be like me. Being on the outside gave me a different vantage point. I got really comfortable walking the various paths of life alone. Like I said, for most of my life, I hated it. There are times where I still do hate it. Nothing was ever clear. Nothing was ever easy. But when that is your normal, when things like the 2008 financial crisis or COVID happen and everything becomes unclear and hard for everybody, it just feels like business as usual for me. When people think of creativity, they often think of the arts, right? Music, painting. To me, creativity is all about taking what's inside my head and getting it inside of yours. The space between my starting point and your ending point is art, is creativity. It could be spoken word, right? The word choices, my intonation. It could be a tool, it could be a business. How do I inform, how do I influence, how do I create value? How do I bridge that gap? In the end, what I hated, never knowing a clear path, I was able to transform into one of my superpowers, right? Being able to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, forging my own path, having the confidence to trust that I am seeing things that others aren't. Stress can be tough and often beyond your control and by no means do I adhere to the idea that we all just need to suck it up and move on. You work on the things that are within your control. You get the support that you need. But at the same time, we need to embrace it and we need to persevere through it. You see, hard times, uncertain times, stressful times are typically the periods of greatest learning, of character building and of strengthening. At the top of my talk, I told you the tragic tale about a father and his son. That was actually just the plot of the movie Finding Nemo. You see, in the movie, while the dad, Marlin, goes out on a mission to find his son, Nemo, he encounters a lovable but forgetful blue tangfish named Dory who suffers from extreme short-term memory loss. Now, typically, typically, Dory is sort of a space case, right? You have to take most of the things she says with a grain of salt because you just don't know if you can trust what's coming out of her mouth. But every now and then, she had these moments of clarity, these moments of deep, profound wisdom. And at a moment when Marlon was losing complete control, complete hope of being able to find his son, when he felt like he couldn't dip any lower, 
Dory said to him, you know what you have to do when life gets you down? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And she would sing it to herself over and over. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I, I, I want to take you guys back to the fall of 2008 when there was a major collapse that hit the U.S. financial markets. During this time, people thought their lives were over. They lost all of their savings. In an instant, millions of lives were torn apart. If you look at the graph, it was the most severe recession in almost 100 years. But the interesting thing about the stock market is you typically don't actually lose money just because the stock prices go down. You don't lose just because of the dip. You typically lose money if you sell your stocks when the market are in a dip. You lose if you get out when things are bad. So you don't lose based on what the market has done. You lose based on how you respond to the bad situation. Are you feeling me? In life, you don't lose, you don't fail. The game isn't over when times get tough. When you hit a brick wall, when you're in the middle of your storm, when you've fallen on hard, stressful times, no matter how far you've fallen or how far behind you think you are, you only lose when you quit. Your situation doesn't mean that you lost. Life is all about how you respond to your situations. And for those who endure, let's, let's see what perseverance looks like. If you look at the next slide here, this is four years after the Great Recession. The markets were restored to their peak period before the recession. See, no matter how bleak things look, know that stresses are temporary. The pain is temporary. Struggle is temporary. The feelings of hopelessness and frustration is temporary. If you just keep swimming, brighter days are ahead. But here's the beautiful thing. The resilience that you build up during your difficult season not only helps you restore to where you were, but it'll take you to where you never thought you would be. This is 10 years after the recession. Do you remember that huge, terrible point in your life that was so insurmountable, that was absolutely devastating, that you couldn't possibly recover from. Do you remember that? Do you remember that breakup when you lost your job? Do you remember that death in your family, that sickness? I know you remember that quarantine. Do you remember how your life felt like it was over? That period that was once so large, it consumed your entire existence. Now look, it looks like a tiny blip on your life's journey. Do you guys, you guys hear that? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. But wait, there's more. You see, the hard times are not just potholes along the road of life meant to hinder and annoy us. But get this, these are actually blessings. I know some of you are thinking my hard times have not been a blessing to me, but just bear with me. If we go back to 2008, 2009, and look at Apple, the company. During the recession, Apple stock was valued at 12 to $13. The months leading up to the dip, the stock was valued at $25. The company didn't suddenly become less innovative in those couple of months. The iPhone didn't lose popularity. In fact, the very opposite. But due to forces that were external to the company, Apple now found themselves in this dip. Did you catch it? It was subtle. Something that was worth $25 was now on sale for half price because of a bad situation. People get scared of investing because of recessions, because they're scared of losing it all. But in reality, recessions are the best time to invest. 
All the best companies are on sale. You might be finding yourself in a period of your life where your valuation is being impacted by your situation. Let me repeat that. You might be finding yourself in a period where your valuation is being impacted by your situation. Your work might not see you for all your worth. You might not be getting the recognition you deserve. Nobody is swiping right on your profile. COVID has put your career on hold. During recessions, companies often need to restructure because during the good times, they pick up some bad habits that aren't necessarily beneficial to them. But during the good times, it's hard to notice and it's easy to let some things slide. But during hard times, it forces you to take a hard look at everything you're doing and it enables you to form the habits and learn to tap into new strengths. You build the endurance during your hardships. In your dips, you're learning the skills, building the character, preparing yourself for that next stage of your life. Just keep swimming. Trust that you have everything that you need. And instead of fighting to get out of and avoid stressful and hard situations, embrace them, learn from them, let them shape, sharpen, and strengthen you. That LinkedIn comment came during a very stressful and draining time, especially for the Black community. At first, it brought me down. But now I'm turning that experience into an entire movement and I'm working on a new initiative to fight racial discrimination in the workplace. Now I'm talking to dozens of companies to see how we can work together to address these issues. Racism is draining. I entered the workforce in 2008 during that major recession. Now I'm running a business during COVID. I've had tons of other personal stressors that I won't get into, but all of these things could have broken me. And I could have let them consume me and it would have been totally justifiable. But instead, I let them mold me. Everyone on this call is going through things and is going to face their own challenges and stresses. But we have to remember that one, you have everything that you need whether it's your own skills, your resources, your network, your faith, you have the tools, the people, the strength to get you through this. Number two, embrace it. Allow these times to shape you, to strengthen you. You are gonna come out of this. So it's just a matter of if you're gonna let it transform you for the better. And three, Adversity brings creativity, and your creativity will shape your whole life. So just keep swimming. The world is <laughs> excited to have you here. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just curious. Sometimes I feel embarrassed to be white. Any thoughts? I'll just call it. It's embarrassing sometimes. I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with a laugh of nervousness. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what to do with that exactly. Um, I think, you know, you're, you're in a position where you can help bridge the gap. Um, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're going to be listened to or be able to go into spaces and speak in a more direct way, uh, you know, that, that other people won't. So as like insider, you have the ability to influence other people and what they're thinking and, you know what I mean, and have those uh, tougher conversations. So I think, you know, as that type of, you know, double agent, it's, it, you have a lot of power. And so making sure that you are very educated and making sure that you understand the voice of, of these people that you're trying to represent, and then just being able to guide them, right? So if you can make it a little bit more palatable, you know what I mean? And then you can kind of point them in the right direction of, of you know, where they should be. But I think, you know, you're, you're in a u unique position where you can have a lot of influence 
over over your group of people, over your family, over your community. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something you should definitely take advantage of. Uh, awesome. And just can I say, like, we were in our little chat, we were saying, it's hard. I love that you called Canada out a little bit there and said, like, because we can't reconcile if we're not truthful. Mm-hmm. I, I actually, I really got that from this. Like, I, it was very hopeful what you're saying, just keep swimming, such a powerful thing. But I also think we need to be bold about confronting some things or we won't, we won't move on. We'll be in that stuck pattern of like denial. So I totally deeply yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the, you know, my whole thing with the unfortunate of living in the shadow of the U S is that so many of us will continue to point there and be like, well, we're not that. So we clearly don't have a problem. Right. And, and, and never taking the time to reflect and look internally to see what are we doing wrong? Where is our problem? Uh, you know, even then it's like when we consume media, we mostly consume U.S. media. And so it's like we, we never say like, oh, there's anything going on here. Plus, we don't talk about these types of things on the media. It's like I, I've encountered plenty of situations that were worthy of news. If they were in the States or if these things happened in the States, they would have been news and they would have, uh, you know, had that type of visibility. So it's kind of the pros and the cons where it's, you know, because of what's happening with Black Lives Matters in the U.S., it's helping to, to shine a light what's going on here but then because it's in the u.s people have you know created the identity what well, well it's their problem it's not our problem and so if it wasn't for them then we wouldn't be having these conversations in canada because it happening alone in canada is not enough to get the attention of canadians we need it to happen in the u.s so that we we get capture it. but then it gives us the uh, you know the chance to say well it's not us it's it's them um, so it's kind of in this weird limbo state where, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we've increased the conversation, but then we've also um, denied the, 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 the liability of, of our own country. Yeah, I think you're spot on there, Nathan, for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jen, if I may just, uh, we have a few more questions here, but I just want to say like, yeah, as a you know, white person of privilege, that, that embarrassment and like shame, I think that's something we got to sit with. You know, we got to sit with, we got to think about why that is. And, and like Nathan said, like, think about the things we can do to rectify or to, to help support and amplify. Yes, hi. I think uh, I just wanted to thank you for your talk. It was, um, I, I really enjoyed it. And I uh, just had a quick question. Um, I like that quote that you said, your, that your situation can impact your evaluation. And I just wanted to know if there are things that you do um, to, I guess, keep that situation at a good place or at a place where your valuation doesn't go down <laughs> are there tricks you can share uh, i yeah I, I don't know if i can summarize them in, into any tricks or, or tips um you know i think always just keeping in mind what's within your control versus what's outside of it uh you know what i mean like i, I control how i react to situations i control Um, you know, what I expose myself to or my education level or my empathy. Um, And so I always just try and spend the time doing that where it's like I'm building up the underlying, like, excuse the business terms, um, I'm building up my underlying assets where it's like, okay, I know the value of what I'm, I'm creating, right? So, you know, let's say like education, where it's like, okay, I'm going to school, I'm getting the degree, I'm learning all of these things. That doesn't instinct automatically, you know, especially today's day and age when you graduate, it doesn't mean you're just going to get a job right out of school and it's going to be paying well and it's going to be your dream job and all these types of things. But that's not defining the value and the worth of all the knowledge that you've accumulated and the skill sets and all of those things. So I think always staying rooted into what is the true value of what I'm creating, regardless of if other people recognize it or not. Um, You know, it's like, I I see people with like Instagram and stuff all the time where it's just like, oh, how come my Instagram's not popping? Like I'm I'm doing all this great content. I have all these great pictures, but then this person has like 50,000 followers and like all they did was take a picture of their soup and it's like, they get like thousands of likes for this. How come it's not equal to me? And to me, it's like, you know, just, in, keep on investing in your in yourself to make sure that you're happy with what you're doing right is the content you're creating the best like according to you like is this the, the greatest song you've ever written is this the greatest 
speech? Is this, you know, whatever, the best thing you've ever designed? And just keep doing, like, staying true to yourself. Um, you know, people might not recognize it. They might recognize it in five years from now, 10 years from now. They might not ever recognize it. But I think just staying true to yourself um, and keep on investing in those things that you believe have true value, I think is the only, is the best way that we can do it. You can't really control the world if, you know, thousands of people are going to start following me. I can't control that. I just control the content that I'm putting out there. So uh, it's kind of actually maybe a bit similar to the last question that you just got asked, but I'll really quickly. So when you say like, just keep swimming, what's like one thing that you implement in your life that's like a just keep swimming, like coping mechanism? Uh, um, I think not, not necessarily a coping thing, but definitely just like the leaning into it where before it was like, anytime I could have gotten out of a bad situation or a stressful situation, I would take it. Right. And then I got to the point where it's like, uh, say like public, public speaking, where it's like, okay, I was absolutely terrified. Was it good? This is like, you know, I, I need to get better at it. So every time I have the opportunity to speak, I'm going to take it. I'm just going to keep pushing myself and intentionally throwing myself into the deep end. Um, and, and so that, you know, that build up the endurance and that build up the skills and the capability to keep doing harder and harder things. And so it was a recognition that no matter how hard things are feeling in the moment, um, you know, it's usually those things that I'm most happy and proud that I did afterwards. And so it was always just keeping that, that longer term view of not to give in to the immediate fear, but just recognizing once I get through this, am I going to be happier that I did it than if I didn't do it? And then that, so that has just kept me going, uh, you know, just to keep swimming. So thanks so much for the presentation. Um, this is veering off the topic a little bit of stress, but what I noticed uh, from your presentation that was extremely impressive was uh, your ability to storytell. So I wasn't sure if I was watching like a, a poetry performance, <laughs> uh, maybe a bit of both. Um, and then just overall, the way you were able to deliver a message, I think is becoming um, more and more of a skill set. Uh, in this virtual world that we're entering in. So I just wanted to ask like a, and I don't know if it's a, something you can sum up quickly, but like, what is your, what is your, what does your process look like when you were uh, designing this uh, presentation? Like, did you start with your intention? Did you, were you whiteboarding? How did you get to like this masterpiece? Um, thank you. Um, I'd say just always just writing down thoughts. Like I don't write um, in a very linear fashion. So I'll just be like, oh yeah, that's a thing. I got to write that down. And then, so I'm just kind of throwing pieces together and then I kind of figure out how to make it all gel together. So, you know, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm never sure like, oh, does this flow properly? Am I getting my full thoughts? Because to me, it's like, it's always just like, thoughts are coming to my head or like I'm pulling stuff from different areas and then I just kind of write them down as they come. Um, so oftentimes like I can use like, um, like Google slides and then like for each slide, I'll just have like an idea. Um, and then, so like, I'll just kind of go through like, okay, I want to talk about this, 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 and that. And then like, I don't know how they're going to come tie together at this point. It's just kind of throwing all the ideas down or it's like, oh yeah, that's a point that I want to get to. And so it's just kind of random stuff. It could be a quote. It could be a full thought. It could be just a word. Um, but I just make sure I get down whatever I have. And then I kind of go back, massage it, go back. I flip the slides around and then I just kind of go from there. And then it's just practice, practice, practice. The more you do it, the better you get. Yeah. Yeah.